Hello biologists, this is lab 3.18, factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. And you can probably take a good guess about one factor that affects the rate of photosynthesis. It's a cloudy day here, so I had to turn on some serious lights to light the video. We can look at five different factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. The first one is the amount of light. Is it a sunny day? Is it a cloudy day? If you're using an artificial light source, how close is it? The type of light, mostly the color, also affects photosynthesis. We'll talk more about this later in the lab. Heat, the temperature the plants are at. Carbon dioxide, how much is available for the plants. And humidity also affect photosynthesis. For question two on your lab sheet, make sure you're using the lab sheet from doc sharing. You need to know the equation for photosynthesis. And here it is. You take carbon dioxide out of the air, if you're a plant that grows on land, or out of the water, if you're a plant that grows in the water, plus water. If you're a plant that grows on land, you get that from the air as humidity, or from your roots, mostly from your roots. You use the power of sunlight, the energy in sunlight, to combine these two compounds and your product is glucose, that sugar we've talked so much about in this class, plus oxygen gas. And I'll show you what the oxygen gas looks like in just a moment. Here I have a jar of lettuce and the lettuce is underwater with a light on it so that we can see as it produces oxygen gas in photosynthesis, we can see the bubbles. If I wiggle it a little bit, you can see the bubbles move and float to the top. I pulled the webcam back a little bit so you can see how close this light is. You need a lot of light intensity for this lettuce to photosynthesize. It's a little bit tired because it's been in the refrigerator for a while and it needs quite a bit of light. This is an artificial light, so it doesn't have the same colors that sunlight does. So it takes a little bit more of this light to get the, the plant to photosynthesize. But you can see how close that light is. And this light is very hot. Here I have an infrared thermometer that takes the temperature of things without actually having to touch it things. And I'm going to take the temperature of the surface of this light here that's up against the jar. You can see that it's pretty darn hot. It's 238 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty toasty. So when we use a light close to a jar like that, we get two variables that affect the rate of photosynthesis. We get light and heat. And that's what we're going to talk about in question three. When we set the light close here to the lettuce, it gets really hot. We get high light intensity and we also get a high temperature. When we put the light far away, the lettuce cools down and it gets less light. So in the lesson, it's a poor experimental design because they're changing two variables at once. Let's talk about question four. In the lesson, I've recorded the number of bubbles each minute. This first column here is when the light is very far away and the light intensity is low. The second column, or second row, excuse me, is when the light is very close and there's a high light intensity. So it's your job, since I did the work and collected the data for you, to average the numbers in yellow here when the light was far away and put your average here for number four. And when the light is close, add up all these numbers. There are 10 of them, so you divide by 10. Remember averaging, you add up all the numbers and divide by the number of data points, which is 10. So you can find the averages there. Just pause the video and grab your calculator. Add up the 10 numbers for far away and divide by 10. Add up the green numbers for close and divide by 10. I've helped you out by, because I graphed all of the numbers as well. 
And this line here is a line of best fit. It's kind of where all the points would line up if you sort of took the average of all of them. I put a line of best fit here too. This, these red or squares represent when the light was very far away. Here's when the light was close. We measured in the experiment the number of bubbles being produced by a plant that was underwater, a lot like the plant with just the lettuce that we looked at. The number of bubbles represents the rate of photosynthesis. So if you have more bubbles, you're getting more oxygen and photosynthesis is going faster. So up here, we can see that photosynthesis is going faster when the light is very close. In other words, if you have more light, photosynthesis goes faster or goes at a higher rate. If you pull the light away and decrease the light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis goes down. Low light, low intensity. Of course, in both the experiment here with the lettuce and the experiment in the virtual lab, you have to include heat as a variable as well. This is a hot test tube full of plants, and this is a cooler test tube. Here's a graph that shows us that as you increase light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis increases, but only up to a point. After a while, you can, um, it levels off. Adding more light doesn't make it go up anymore. Here, scientists were measuring the amount of CO2 that was used. They were looking at the reactants in the, re the equation. We were looking at the products, the oxygen. So for number six, let's talk about whether heat or light would affect photosynthesis more. And it turns out this isn't a simple question. It depends on where you are, what the temperature is, and what the light is. You can see in this graph of temperature, versus rate of photosynthesis, if you add more heat at certain temperatures, the rate of photosynthesis increases and it peaks out about 30 degree, 38 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Celsius, which just happens to be our body temperature, 98.6. Then if you heat plants over 37 degrees or 98.6, the rate of photosynthesis decreases. So you can add heat up to a point and increase the rate, but then once a plant is so hot, it doesn't increase the rate of photosynthesis anymore. Same with light. You can add more light and more light and more light and it will increase the rate of photosynthesis, but you can only add so much light and then the rate of photosynthesis le levels off because the plant can only take up the reactants, carbon dioxide and water so quickly. Let's talk about number seven in a minute here. I'm gonna go straight to number eight. We talked a little bit about why we put the plants underwater. We wanted to look at how the rate of photosynthesis. So we looked at the products, the end of the equation here. It's hard to look at glucose in real time. You have to kind of chop up the plant to get the glucose out. But since oxygen leaves the plant as a gas, if you put it underwater, you can count the bubbles. If scientists have more sophisticated equipment, they can monitor oxygen being produced in plants that aren't underwater. But we're doing a simple experiment, so simple tools will work. Number nine, can you think of a situation where a high temperature would not result in an increase in photosynthesis? Well, let's imagine you're outside and it's midnight. All the street lamps are turned off, you don't have a flashlight? Is there any sunlight? It's pretty darn dark. And if it's dark, it doesn't really matter what temperature the plant is at. No photosynthesis is gonna go on. So if there's no light, it doesn't matter what the other factors that affect photosynthesis are. You can't do photosynthesis without light. So plants at night don't, don't photosynthesize. They do cellular respiration as they do during the day to break down glucose, but they don't do photosynthesis. No light, no photosynthesis. 
changing any of the other factors, humidity, carbon dioxide, temperature, will not affect photosynthesis unless there's light. So light's the most important thing. Okay, now let's go back to question seven. Why was it important to add baking soda to the water in the lab? Well, let's look at the equation below to explain. Plants need carbon dioxide. If your plant's just sitting in your living room, it can take carbon dioxide out of the air. And plants in the underwater get carbon dioxide through the water in a number of ways, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But we added baking soda to quickly increase the level of carbon dioxide. Because the formula for baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. When it dissolves, you get bubbles and you get carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide stays dissolved in the water for the plant. Right here, you can see a little bit of the baking soda here that didn't dissolve. Baking soda into the jar right here, and it dissolved. The plant took it up, photosynthesized, and these little bubbles right here are oxygen. See how they're clinging to the leaves? Because the leaves are photosynthesizing. And you'll notice right here, not all plants just are green. Some of them have other pigments in them that make them uh, look not green. So question 10 asks, what if you don't have baking soda? What if you live in the ocean and no one's adding baking soda to the water? Well, phytoplankton are in that situation. They're tiny little plants that live in the ocean that provide a lot of oxygen for planet Earth and for the fish. Um, they're also very important in climate change because they soak up a lot of CO2. And since no one adds baking soda to the ocean, it has to get some there some other ways. One of the ways it gets there is rain. Rain falls down and picks up carbon dioxide as it goes through the air. Waves are also a big part of adding carbon dioxide. They also add oxygen for the fish. As wave action stirs the water up, it adds oxygen and carbon dioxide from the air. Fish also add carbon dioxide. Remember, fish don't photosynthesize. They only do cellular respiration. So all of the animals that live in the ocean are doing cellular respiration, which produces carbon dioxide as a product. For question 11, what are the two factors that climate change alters? The two factors that alter the rate of photosynthesis that are involved in climate change are global temperature and carbon dioxide. And this is a difficult question because scientists are still exploring this question. Carbon dioxide you can increase and it will increase the rate of photosynthesis a little bit but it turns out that weeds do better when you add carbon dioxide to the air than some of our crops. Temperature will increase the rate of photosynthesis to a point but in the tropics um, the maximum rate of photosynthesis is already reached in many plants so it may not increase the rate of photosynthesis in the tropics it may do it in the Arctic. Let's look at a graph of plants in the Arctic, which relates to question number 12. Which plant do you think here lives in the Arctic? Plants in the Arctic and Antarctic, this, in this case it happens to be the Antarctic, are adapted to living at low, much lower temperatures than plants in the tropics or plants in temperate regions like where we live. You can see that this plant here has a maximum photosynthesis rate at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. That's about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Where this plant reach, reach, reaches a maximum of maximum photosynthesis rate at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius which is more like a nice warm 80. So if global climate change happens in the Antarctic, these plants will likely get a little bit too warm 
depending on how much 